good evening friends i welcome you all this is the second uh, annual automotive futures lecture that we are having and uh, we started this series last year and uh, we have the pleasure of having with us uh, today professor michel danino and uh, i'm sure it's going to be a wonderful talk that you will all enjoy let me just say a few words about uh, this series as i said we started it last year it's called pathways to visionary futures uh, the idea is that to call people who have been doing thinking about our collective future not just in india but also to the whole world and uh, we all think about our presence maybe sometimes we also think about our individual futures but collective futures there are very few people who think about the collective future and i would say that uh, these are the modern rishis of india and uh, we hope to do this every year and call very deep fundamental thinkers and i'm sure today you will have a, a very wonderful uh, talk by professor danino because uh, let me say uh, when he's through with the talk you realize that he knows so much more about indian culture and civilization than most of us here do and it's so much more creditable because he was born in france and he's been living in india for the past 40 years so i'll just say uh, tell you a, a little bit about professor danino and then i'll just invite him here and ask him to begin his talk he was born in france in 1956 he's been living in india since 1977 he's an indian citizen he has been awarded yesterday this year and he has received yesterday the padmashri from the president <laughs> although that did not influence our choice we called him first and then we heard that he has won the padam shri so uh, he's written uh, <coughs> some very important books and quite a few more down the line are on the way in the next few years uh, there is one there are two books that are available outside uh, in case those who want to see or buy the one is indian culture in india's future that was the book and the title that really attracted me i looked at his work and i said this is astounding you know this whole thing about we in india in our education system you know we go through it we pass out we become adults and we realize we have learned so little about indian culture and civilization so that is something he is addressing and he is also raising this question why that happens then another of his book is called <clears throat> the lost river on the trail of the saraswati published by penguin in 2010 uh he has lectured at many institutes in india he has been a scholar in residence at iit kanpur twice he is currently a uh, guest professor at iit gandhinagar where he has assisted in setting up an archaeological sciences center and uh, he has been also very actively interested in uh, nature conservation he has lived in the nilgiri hills for many years and uh, he has been particularly during those years he has been working on those issues Uh, he has co-edited with professor kapil kapoor a two volume textbook on knowledge traditions and practices of india which is a cbse elective course for classes 11 and 12 he is a convener of the international forum for india's heritage and he has been coordinating a project to produce a multimedia educational dvd on science and technology in ancient india since 2015 he has been a member of the indian council of historical research so but i let his ideas and words speak more than his introduction that i have given so professor danino <laughs> may i ask aditi to hand the booklet Namaste, and my thanks first of all to Dr. Rakesh Kapoor for inviting me to give this talk. I think we started corresponding a few, quite a few months ago, and um, initially I was a little hesitant because this is about alternative futures, and I do understand the need for deep thinking about the kind of future. uh we are preparing 
for our children and grandchildren. Um, my area of research mainly is the past rather than the future. Uh, it has been, you know, in fact, what we technically call the proto-history of India, that is to say the very beginnings um, inclusive of the Indus civilization and the later phases that ultimately created the classical civilization of India. So uh, this is my, you know, almost daily uh, center of interest. And uh, therefore, uh, to draw some, to draw some hints, leads, lessons from the past and project them, project them onto the future is always a challenging thing to do. And yet we are, have to do that because we have nothing else to uh, go by. Uh, we cannot start visualizing the future if we do not know what brought us to this point. So therefore, history and the sometimes prehistory can be so critically important. And um, uh, this has been one concern to me, among many others, some of which you will see in the course of this talk, that uh, we have made a mess of the teaching of history in India. We have made it the least interesting, the most resented subject matter at school level. And um, uh, our children, you know, come out of school with a great desire to forget whatever they might have learned or rather mugged up for the exams. And they do succeed in forgetting uh, very much so that <clears throat> at the end of the day, they have really learned nothing uh, of what history should convey. And history is, after all, the uh, most uh, effective vehicle for the culture. You know, the, the, uh, in fact, our courses of history should be primarily about Indian culture and how it developed and the evolution of ideas and so on. So this is not happening. And, uh, but I will be drawing a few um, lessons, I hope, from the past developments of India in, in the cultural field uh, mainly. And in fact, this slide here, I wonder whether we could yeah, switch off this that. particular, uh, this slide which you can see and which is going to reappear <coughs> a, li a little later in the course. Uh, this slide has a big lesson for us. This is how I take it as a kind of a symbol. Uh, maybe f very few of you may be able to identify this place. Uh, it is one of the most uh, stunning structures in India and one of the least known, but we will come back to it. So first of all, I want to take stock. And <clears throat> we have to ask the same question that everybody is asking. So here I'm not saying anything new. I'm quite aware of it. Nevertheless, since as Rakesh kindly mention, I have a, one of my fields have been environmental conservation, and especially facing problems of forest conservation, man-animal conflict, uh, water resources and management in South India. Um, uh, you know, I have been, these questions are extremely concrete uh, in me, and they resonate very, very strongly. And when I see you know, news items like this, for example, you, you are all aware of it. I don't have to comment further on it. This global warming is so much of a fact that uh, governments are actually deceiving us by saying that we can beat the two degree uh, um, rise, uh, you know, by the end of this century. It's actually, this battle is already lost. The question is whether we're going to lose the four degree battle. This is the real question. And you all know the consequences that this will have. It's not about the ambient temperature. It's about what happens to the water resources, to the monsoon system, uh, to the agricultural patterns, and so on and so forth. Look at this. This is something which few of us are actually aware of. We think that the human species can survive almost in isolation. You see, in Delhi, we have very few insects. We have only a few stray dogs, okay, some birds. But that's about it. Our connectivity with nature, of course, in cities is minimized. But we don't realize that there is a long chain behind uh, uh, cities which is uh, virtually invisible. And uh, without this long chain, which involves interdependence, 
of food chains and therefore many species in the world, uh, we will be ourselves an endangered species. And this is the frightening rate at which species disappear, uh, uh, 10,000 times possibly faster than the natural rate. So if we're going to lose half of the higher forms of species by the end of the centuries, there is no way we can remain unaffected. This is another small item which doesn't, uh, you know, we can spend two pages, two full pages daily on cricket on, in our newspapers every day. But how much space do we devote to such events which actually are very threatening? Uh, this is the expansion of dead zones in the oceans. That means <coughs> zones where, which are deprived of oxygen. They are deprived of oxygen because of a plankton which has spread inordinately. Why has it spread? Because we are using fertilizers for agri agriculture in a massive way. And the waste nitrates, the refuse from the uh, fertilizer industry and whatever we are spraying on our fields eventually leaks into the oceans and boosts that particular plankton. So we're creating dead zones where the, the, the life, marine life, is virtually non-existent. And this is already, <coughs> you see, uh, 250,000 square kilometers, a huge area, and it doubles every 10 years. And there is not much that we can do about it as of now. Another phenomenon affecting the oceans, 10 million tons of plastic waste uh, entering every year. And this, we're not talking about big chunks of plastic, but the micro debris of plastic, almost invisible particles, which uh, end up you know, clogging the whole food chain. So this also is supposed to grow 10 times by 2025. What is the net result of this? It is something that the Club of Rome had already foreseen way back in 1971, we were discussing it recently, a few minutes ago, the Club of Rome had published a report called Limits to Growth. Limits to Growth, this was a visionary document at a time where very, very few people were worried about those issues, certainly not our policymakers, uh, even much less our industrialists. <coughs> What the Club of Rome said was that there is only this much that this planet can give us. And if we are to grow in a sustainable manner, and they are among the first to use the term sustainable, then we have to make sure that we don't consume more than what the planet gives us. But <clears throat> today, we are consuming 1.6 planets. We are consuming 60% more than the planet can renew in terms of resources. And this is calculated by the Global Footprint Network to be two planets by two, 2030. So I think the picture is clear. I think all open-minded people <coughs> will agree on the fact that we are going to hit a wall in some way, or many walls. And this line of development which we have adopted is just not something that can continue forever. So therefore, when people keep telling us that we must you know, grow at a rate of 7 or 8 percent a, a year or wha whatever it may be. Well, perhaps for a few years it may be possible. Whether it is desirable or not is an issue I will not discuss today. But this is not something that we can plan for the long term. So therefore, we do need very urgently not short-term planning, not short-term thinking, but long-term engagement with the future of not only our species, but the planet itself. So I'm going now to <coughs> discuss quite um, uh, a little arbitrarily. I have categorized a few lessons from the past in three, under three terms, which you all know, Satyam, Shivam, and Sundaram. It's a convenient classification, nothing more. And uh, I have just uh, uh, you know, mapped a certain few Mm. ingredients from classical ancient Indian civilization, which I think we need to seriously reintegrate in our, uh, not only in our practices, but first of all in our minds, in our hearts, and, and in our decision making. <coughs> so there are Indian values which 
are well known, but they are considered to be, you know, kind of extraneous to us nowadays uh, due to the educational system, as Rakesh mentioned just a few minutes ago. Uh, Indian, the, 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 these these values and this um, contribution of Indian culture, if we want to use simple terms, is becoming almost exotic. You know, India is becoming exotic to Indians and especially to young Indians. So this is a, a major problem where we, we have to, you know, teach these things which should never have had to be taught in the first place or discuss them. So I take the, you see these four well-known goals of human existence, the Purushartha system. So Dharma, Artha, Kama, and uh, Moksha, you know all of them. All of you know them very well, but what exactly does it mean for a well-regulated living? It means things that we need to understand today, especially as far as artha and karma are concerned. Artha is wealth, and this is something we all want to develop, and this is something that our governments tell us that they are going to develop for the common people, which doesn't happen uh, as well as they, they, they hope. But the, in the ancient system, artha is a desirable goal. There is no guilt in, in India in being rich. In fact, uh, even Brahmins, after their, their uh, teachings in the Upanishads, are said to you know, be sent away and acquire wealth for their families at least. So the acquiring acquisition of wealth is a desirable objective. However, provided it comes under dharma. What does it mean in practice? It means that this artha is something, and if you, I mean, I could give, excuse me, I could give lots of examples from the ancient literature, but I will not take time over this. It means that artha is benefiting the society around. The wealth, if it is dharmically used, is not to be used in a purely selfish manner, but to benefit the society and to make sure that the society prospers thanks to you or you return at least to the society something of what you have acquired. And this philosophy has important consequences which I will show a little later through practical examples. Karma is, of course, all forms of enjoyments, we know that, but again, it comes under dharma. So, I don't think we, I need to elaborate very much. The pursuit of karma without dharma is leading to catastrophe, but then this is something which is glorified. In fact, much of you know, the Americanized Western culture that comes to us, I have to say Americanized because there is no such thing as Western culture. We use this term as a simplification, but if you take, for example, European culture, even within Europe, French culture or British culture, are very different from each other. So Americanized, uh, globalized culture, perhaps that would be the proper term to use, it's a bit heavy, is something that does promote karma. You have to enjoy yourself, you have to um, uh, revel uh, as often as possible, and there is no sense of a dharmic limit on it. So this is something which uh, India I understood right from the beginning, and you know, tried to set limits to through this uh, overriding dharma. Moksha we can leave aside for the time being, though I'm coming back to it in a few minutes. Of course, these values are very well known. We complain all the time that they are being lost, but these are values, and that is the main point I want to make, that cannot be taught. They are values that can only be shown through example, living example. And uh, you can tell a child to respect uh, uh, his or her parents as much as you like, uh, it will never work unless the parent is respectable in the first place. So these values uh, were very important and they were explicitly, of course, mentioned, but this is something that, first of all, people should live to begin with. This is extremely important, the concept of swadharma and swabhava. What exactly is that? This is at the very root of you know, the whole philosophy of what has been wrongly called tolerance. Toler we say Hinduism, for example, or Buddhism and or Jainism are tolerant religions. Uh, I find this word 
tolerant, personally a little bit repellent because it's of course a, an English word which comes to us out of the extremely intolerant uh, phase of Christianity. And because in the Enlightenment, philosophers like Voltaire, for example, who wrote a treatise on toleration, had to you know, demand uh, that Christianity should become tolerant and should learn to tolerate uh, um, uh, non-Christians or other Christian denominations, which was mostly the case in, in, in the case of Europe, then this word tolerance came about. In India, I have yet, I have asked many Sanskrit scholars, what is the word for tolerance in the ordinary sense of the term, and nobody has come with an exact equivalent. There are words that kind of uh, can map it, but this is, not, this is not a word that really exists because the concept was so implicit and so inborn in, in the Indian uh, knowledge systems that they, there was no concept of intolerance to begin with. So Swadharma is this, that every one of us has a different dharma. Apart from the overarching dharma, we have a dharma as, as, as a father, as, a, as a, uh, a mother, as a husband, as a wife, as a teacher, as a student, as perhaps an industrialist who want the society to benefit and so on and so forth. So there are almost as many dharmas as there are individuals or functions. And this is something which uh, is fundamental to the Indian experience and it is coupled with the concept of swabhava. Swabhava is the fact that we are all different from each other. Uh, this is what exclusive religions, especially Christianity and Islam, never understood or never wanted to acknowledge. If you and I are different, how can we have the same path of self-fulfillment, to use a neutral term? It's not possible. There cannot be one path for all. And therefore, here we have the great lesson that India could give for a more um, integrated society where people respect each other. And the swab Swabhava is the key. Swadharma also, which means there cannot be a single path. There cannot be a single religion. And there cannot be an exclusivist religion or belief system. If a belief system is exclusivist and claims to have the whole truth, then necessarily it is going to create social uh, issues. This is quite clearly understood in the Indian system. So, so I think this is the key to social and religious harmony. I will return to it very shortly. Trupti <coughs> and a few associated terms. <coughs> are a very discreet Indian concept, not often highlighted, but you find it in a, a number of Subhashitas in particular, you know those sayings, proverbs, which praise people who are modest, self-effaced, who do not throw their weight about, who do not boast. Uh, these are qualities which are highly, uh, uh, highly praised and appreciated in India, and we can still see it in public life. Uh, you know, figures who are hu humble and uh, uh, who do not uh, uh, who do not show arrogance, let us say, are always much more appreciated by the Indian masses than, than those who are not. So contentment, moderation, modesty, self-effacement uh, uh, is something which is an Indian value, typically Indian. It is not very frequently mentioned in Western value systems. But then it is also a key because if we accept uh, this modesty and self-effacement as an important social value, then we will also lessen the question of assertion of identities. What do I mean by that? Look at, for example, Hindu communities in the West. How in the US, in European countries, they have integrated themselves precisely through such values. They are discreet, they do not try to mark themselves as being different. They, have, they do preserve their identity, they do preserve their customs and all this, but 
not in a uh, uh, clashing or, uh, let us say, garish public display. And I think this is something which, again, requires a lot of thinking because uh, we, we have a lot today of studies of identity. So we say a pluralistic society must accept different identities, different communities, and so on and so forth. Yes, of course it must. But the more these communities and components of society assert their separate identities, and the more social frictions we're going to have, which is now very visible, especially uh, in Europe, where country after country is raising flag against the concept of multiculturalism. Because multiculturalism is a concept where you have a kind of a mosaic, that is to say you have this community and that other, and each one wants to keep its distinct identity. But what is it that binds them together? What is it that integrates them together? So this phenomenon of integration, I will return to very briefly, uh, uh, is something that India worked out to a great measure of success, we can say. We know that there are considerable social problems uh, in India, no doubt about it. Nevertheless, the society was very intimately integrated uh, in a way that otherwise would not have produced a nation of India. India could have been a group of nations just like Europe is a group of nations. Europe has tried to integrate itself many times into one. And we can see that it, it's not working. We can, we of course, we have the case of UK right now uh, breaking away from the European community. And even that was not even a political unity. It was only a, a, a kind of economic uh, unity. Uh, we, ha we have, therefore, this contrast, and uh, we can understand that uh, there is something that created this possibility for India to be one nation, and this uh, integration at a deep level, which Europe is still groping with. Trust is a very important Indian value, and uh, the West has instead promoted the value of competition. and. Uh, you know, the, many of you have perhaps taken courses or given courses in business ethics. Who invented in business ethics? The US. Why? Because it was the place where the most unethical business practices were taking place. <laughs> if you have embedded ethics in business, you don't have to talk about it. And you don't have to teach your business ethics. It's kind of understood. So I'm coming back to this in, in a moment. But this concept of trust is, well, let me mention briefly that there are still many in the so-called unorganized sector of India, which represents the biggest chunk of Indian economy. It's not the corporate world. It is well below 20%. The unorganized sector functions mostly through trust today. You have a lot of agreement among business people which do not require signatures. You have loans given and taken in rural areas which are never done with documents, simply oral agreement is sufficient. You have come into entire business communities, for example, the Patels in India and abroad, which have established their business worthiness because people could go to them knowing that because he's a Patel, I can trust him. He's not going to cheat me. So this concept of trust and collaboration, collaboration in the sense of that, of course, business people compete with each other, but they also collaborate. They share information, they share resources. This is still visible in you know, the all areas of our cities where you find all the jewelers clustered together, all the hardware shops clustered together, and so on. Why do they do that? Because they collaborate. Because they find it very convenient to share a lot of common resources, information, and so on. So these values are still at work in India, though we may not be always conscious of them. Let me see what Ashoka tells us very, very briefly. There are many things which Ashoka tells us in his edicts. And uh, though some people may doubt Ashoka's own bona fide, well, we will just take his messages on their face value. And um, this is something that has, again, a lot of teaching, uh, of valuable teachings for the future. Why does he say 
all men are my children. This is one of the very first declaration. All men are my children. Do you have an emperor? Does Alexander the Great, for example, say something like that? Not at all. Quite the opposite. He just wants to you know, crush and conquer and crush and conquer, on and on. So this concept, first of all, here that humanity is one family is, of course, we know the Vasudeva Kutumbakam, I will not repeat it, but this is something that now an emperor is telling us. So there is, again, a certain value which is deeply Indian in that sense and which uh, we, we will need to create a, 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 f a livable future. Of course, he promoted Ahimsa after his so-called conversion with Buddhism, not exactly a conversion, let us call it a change of heart, and vegetarianism. <coughs> and, um, well, uh, I think enough has been said to show the, the uh, importance of these values, at least uh, among, uh, 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 in the society, if not from nation to nation. Compassion is a value which we are very, very fast losing track of in India. It still exists, especially among the common masses. You can still see it in certain situations. But it is, to my mind, I've been in India for 40 years, and I can see that uh, uh, it is something that modern living kind of dispenses with. And, uh, well, you have here compassion for human beings, but for also for animals through the, the digging of the providing of wells and trees, through the protection of wild animals in what we today would call forest sanctuaries, and even medical care give, being given to wild animals. Uh, he wants fair treatment, fair treatment for the prisoners. He wants release of the aged prisoners, and he wants even uh, the care of the families of prisoners, very, very advanced uh, compared to the present stage of the you know, penitentiary system, very forward-looking uh, and compassionate thinking. These are values which our societies need more and more. And where does he find glory? Not in having conquered a colossal empire, as he did, in fact, but in having his subjects respect and practice dhamma. Dhamma is dharma hmm? in Pali. So... You know, this is again something that you do not find in European conquerors. They were great military geniuses. They were great integrators. Well, for a while, because Alexander the Great's empire, for example, disintegrated almost immediately upon his death. You might say that the Mauryan empire did not outlast Ashoka for very, very long. It is true, but there were other factors at work. And see what he says about what today we call religious harmony. He says, nobody should show excess devotion or praise for his religion. Again, this notion of being discreet, effaced. Don't praise your religion excessively because, and don't condemn other religions. And we are now, remember, we are in about the third century BC. We are even before the birth of Christianity, right? So he's only talking about what? About what today we would recognize as Hinduism, the Vedic schools and the late Vedic schools, Buddhism, the Buddhist schools, and there were already several of them, the Jain schools, and several of other sects like the Ajivikas, for example, which have disappeared uh, since. So these are the, the, when he says the religions, these are those he means. And he says, all should be well learned in the good doctrines of other religions. So do not be fanatical about your own. Do not fanatically condemn other religions, and, but instead study them. And we have great and simple keys there, which to my mind are essential to uh, the future of you know, religious harmony, if at all it is possible. I'd like to have a few words on the Gita, because <clears throat> in the present culture, we have, we still praise the Gita, of course, but we fail to realize the practical uh, implications that we can draw from it. And I think this concept of Nishkama Karma is something that, again, the <coughs> Americanized culture which comes to us, and not a particularly a critique of, of, of the West, 
but I, you know, can see the very fundamental differences in value systems. And it is a fact that American culture has promoted this concept of success. The overriding importance of succeeding in life. What is succeeding? It is being a winner. It is not being a loser, therefore. So you have uh, this contrast between uh, winners and losers. And, um, uh, you know, it means uh, fame, it means money, it means many things. Now, because the Gita completely removes from you the responsibility for the fruits of your action, you are only responsible for being sincere in your action. That's about all it is. Sincerity in your action, in pursuing, of course, dharmic goals, and striving your hardest towards them. But the fact whether your action fails or succeeds should leave you perfectly equal-minded, which is not easy at all to practice. We all know that. However, this is what the Gita puts in front of us. In that philosophy, there cannot be a winner and there cannot be a loser. There cannot be success and there cannot be failure. Actually, the concept is completely taken away from you. So I think that in today's living, I, found, I have found personally very, very great strength in such concepts. And, um, you know, we come across more and more depressed uh, young Indians. Uh, we still have about 6,000 young Indians committing suicide every year for all kinds of reasons. And, of course, all bad reasons. And if I believe that if, you know, they could be, in, you know, taught, again, not through preaching and not through textbook lessons to be marked up, but through living examples, those values, then they would, they would see you know, adversity in a very different way because adversity becomes an opportunity and not uh, something to feel bad about. So this is what the Gita tells us, but it also tells us the need to defend dharma. In the Gita, neutrality is rejected. And interestingly, ahimsa is rejected. Because if you remember the story, Arjuna at the beginning takes what I might call, if you will excuse the, the tone, takes a Gandhian line. He tells Krishna that, look, I don't want to fight. Why should I destroy my family? It's, it's, I'm going to spill uh, my own blood. And if they want the kingdom, they then keep it. You know, why should, this is exactly, you know, the line of Ahimsa. And Krishna spends the whole preaching of the Gita in convincing him that this is a wrong approach, a wrong thinking, and wrong values, because if he does that, then, then of course, uh, he's going to leave the whole field to a dharma. So it is not for his own kingdom or for his own glory that he must fight, but for dharma to be established. And I think also this is a great lesson because I, even though ahimsa is something extremely valuable, especially at the individual level, at, in, at the level of interpersonal relationships, it is something that may or may not work at the level of nations. And uh, for example, when, let us say, India allowed Tibet to be invaded, knowing full well that this would bring China to uh, its doorsteps, or did not, you know, oppose such an, an obviously adharmic uh, uh, invasion, uh, I think it committed. Or when, again, India did not accept the advice of its own army, uh, you know, in 1948 in Kashmir, when the Indian army was telling uh, our leaders that we can recover the area of Kashmir that Pakistan has occupied. And we took a line away from, from this by, you know, uh, trying to have uh, good relations with our neighbor and uh, having, you know, the intervention of the United Nations and so on, uh, we found ourselves saddled with a problem which even today we cannot resolve. So there are certain here philosophies which have implications. I do not mean to say that they are very easy to apply. Uh, they require a lot of thinking, but very clearly there are situations where the use of force or engagement, at least, uh, are quite legitimate. 
Another important <coughs> value system that emerges from ancient India is the quest for knowledge. And we have here a few depictions of uh, most of them, uh, the top left is Bharut, about third century BC. Second right, top right is a child learning Brahmi letters. Uh, this is a terracotta uh, a figure found in Haryana, <coughs> and I think it is in the National Museum. It's a very young child uh, learning the alphabet and proudly displaying his knowledge. And below you have from Konark Temple, uh, a guru and his uh, shishyas. There has been, of course, a great concern with knowledge. And knowledge, in fact, perhaps India is the only civilization that turns turn even knowledge into a goddess, you know, Saraswati. So, so this uh, quest for knowledge has resulted in complex educational systems which culminated in uh, this famous uh, University of Nalanda. It was actually a monastery, more than a university, but it did function as one uh, in view of the large number of students, about 8,000, we are told, by Chinese pilgrims. Uh, the number of lectures, 100 lectures a day, we are told. The democratic functioning, there was a student body involved in decision making and uh, the whole complexity of the, of the establishment and the large number of subject matters that form part of the teaching. So this is the kind of culmination. After this, we have somewhat of a decline, which is not a complete decline because it is more of a de decentralization. The, the, the educational system becomes completely scattered and goes down to the village level in a still very efficient manner, but uh, uh, not with such grand establishments anyway. So this quest of knowledge led to certain important traditions, we can call them knowledge traditions, which I think are extremely important today. And in India in particular, we can feel the need for them almost every day when you open the, your daily newspaper. It's about the art of debating and the, the way of resolving conflicts. And um, well, we have of course lots of examples in the Upanishads, for example, Nachiketa who debates with Yama uh, about the fundamental questions of what is life and what is death. We have the famous the uh, dialogue between Janaka and Gargi, you remember the story uh, uh, about the, the, again, the nature of the self. So these debates are important because they show that the, the intellectual um, uh, tradition encourages challenge, challenging the guru, challenging the one who has knowledge. Uh, we have more examples like the famous uh, Yaksha Prasna in the Mahabharata where we, it's a kind of a quiz that Yudhishthira is subjected to in order to save his uh, brothers. So a very fascinating, in fact, uh, dialogue. So this, this tradition can be seen at many levels. Historically, more historically, if I may say so, we have Shankaracharya debating, challenging the Mimamsa scholars and the Buddhist scholars also. And we are told according to the Shankara tradition, uh, overcoming their arguments and therefore establishing a kind of a rebirth of uh, Hinduism, especially uh, the, the Advaita Vedanta school. So these, these traditions were not just, you know, common dialogues. There were certain rules of engagement and uh, those rules of engagement were spent out in um, texts which are called uh, Yukti, uh, uh, text, for example, there is a Yukti Tantra, which was taught at Nalanda University to train the students in the art of debate. That is to say, how do you construct an argument? How do you validate the strength of your argument? How you can contradict somebody else's argument? And of course, the rule of civility and the way of dialoguing in, in a polite, civilized manner. I think this is something we have almost completely lost because today our campuses dialogue through sticks and uh, brick bats and uh, clearly this is not the way forward. So if we wish to 
be worthy of you know our civilizational heritage, uh, we should you know offer these very conflicting sides a common platform, not a boxing ring, but a common platform where they can actually engage and debate their, their schools of thought, whatever their school of thought may be. This is not happening. You do not have in India opposing, uh, you know, let us say con uh, uh, conflictual uh, uh, sides taking a common platform and trying to at least exchange their views and uh, see whether some conflicts are resolvable. It's not happening, yet it is embedded in the Indian tradition. And the result was that when you read the old texts, you have a great sense of intellectual self-confidence. You see that all the authors, scholars of whatever, philosophy, uh, mathematics, astronomy, uh, 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 literary texts of all kinds, you find one thing common to them, and I could give, if I had the time, many examples, self-confidence. There is an intellectual confidence because they are rooted, first of all, deeply rooted in their own culture, in their own knowledge systems, and they know how to argue and they know how to defend their point of view. Therefore, they're not afraid. So we see, for example, uh, Brahma Gupta uh, passing strictures on his predecessor, Aryabhatta, on a point of astronomy. And he says this Aryabhatta doesn't know anything about mathematics and astronomy. It's there written in black and white in his own text. So there is an engagement. You're free to criticize. You're free to oppose. You're free to reject. But there are certain rules on how to conduct these dialogues. So this freedom to challenge and dissent is very important. It has to be preserved, and it is theoretically preserved today. But in fact, it is often stifled too. And uh, the more you try to stifle it, and the more frustration you create at the end of the day. So this is the foundation of civilized debates, which I think we are going to need more and more, because we can see the inten intensification of the conflicts. Now, one main line of development of this quest for knowledge, you have already seen a couple of examples from the Upanishads, was the quest for the meaning of life. This is something that the Upanishads are concerned with. This is something that the Gita is concerned with and many, many more texts and schools, uh, whether they are the Buddhist, the Jain, the Hindu schools, uh, everybody was in search of the meaning of life. And uh, this is very interestingly the one thing that you will never find in any of our school textbooks. None of them, except for perhaps philosophy textbooks at college level, which mostly will deal with Western systems of philosophy, M very rarely the Indian ones. Otherwise, we never offer the school child a reflection on the meaning of life. It's perhaps considered unsecular, and yet it should almost be the first lesson number one when you enter school. These are simple examples from uh, left uh, Mohanjo-Daro, the Indus civilization, about 4,500 years ago. And right about 3,000 years ago, a skeleton found in Padmasana in, in a site in Rajasthan. So we know that these yogic practices have a very ancient history in India. And, um, and this has been considered as, as you all know, uh, one of the fundamental quests uh, of this country. So much so that these yogic systems, of course, I first of all, in their most external aspects, have migrated abroad, they have filled a need, they have filled a gap, they have filled a void in the West. There was certainly a void, a great void, because it was nothing that was planned. Uh, it was rather a demand from the West rather than a supply from India. And um, therefore, we have such uh, cover stories uh, uh, explaining that 15 to 20 million Americans uh, practice some form of yoga or meditation. So this has been an important silent contribution of India and certainly has contributed to the well-being, you know, the, the, the inner well-being of Western populations. In fact, there was even an article uh, in Newsweek a couple of years ago, which was titled, uh, this is Newsweek, published in the US, 
And the title of the article was, We Are All Hindus Now. So, of course, this is meant to shock the readers, but then the article went on enumerating, you know, the inroads that Hindu beliefs, like karma, like uh, rebirth, and so on, and practices sometimes, you know, have made in American culture. So when I speak of Americanized culture entering India, I'm very well aware that Indian culture also enters the West. And this interchange, in a way, is healthy, is unavoidable, but then we have to be conscious of what it implies in the Indian context. Shivam, briefly, what have I categorized under Shivam? That is to say, goodness, auspiciousness, what in particular mean, means the well-being of the society? Very simple things. First of all, an intelligent concern with sustainability in ancient India. These very important water structures are 4,600 years old. They are from Dholavira, a, site, a Harappan site in Gujarat. And this tradition goes on. And we find people developing techniques to make a city like this one sustainable for 700 years in a place, this is the run of Kutch, where today you have no city, no town, not even a big village. And you have a big city in this location sustained for 700 years and even disintegrating slowly afterwards when we already know that the rainfall was almost as scanty as it is today. They did it by creating colossal water structures and something like between 15 and 20 hectares dedicated to water harvesting out of roughly 50 hectares. And therefore, we <laughs> see that these people again have a lot of self-confidence. They know they can you know, manage a situation. And contrary to what we do today, they find local solutions to local problems. And to me, this is a great lesson for sustainability issues. Today, we find non-local solutions for local problems. For example, the same Gujarat today depends vitally on water from the Narmada River. Okay, there is a huge, you know, the, the uh, Narmada Sarova <coughs> water system brings a lot of Narmada water to Gujarat, without which agriculture would <coughs> become very difficult and even the livelihood of the cities themselves. So we are, of course, creating more and more unstable systems because if anything happens there, then you are in trouble here. But of course, the Harappans didn't have this choice. They could not, perhaps they could have, but they actually put their minds into solving the local problems locally. And this, of course, is a much more intelligent uh, um, uh, approach because it is much more under your control. I'm well aware that today's cities have populations a hundred times more than the Harappan cities. I know that. I know that our problems are far more complex today. I'm not saying that Harappan solutions will solve our problems, not at all. I'm simply saying that there is a certain philosophy, a certain approach to sustainability that we can draw lessons from, especially when we see, as we do today, that we are more and more in uh, unstable solution. This was last year in Latour, where there was absolutely no water left. So again, a distant solution, which of course had to be adopted, trains and trains of water to bringing water to this city. This is not something that can go on forever. <coughs> Today, this, at present, my own city of Coimbatore has no drinking water left. The lake, which is actually located in, in Kerala, not in Tamil Nadu, the lake which supplies drinking water to the city is dry, bone dry. So what is the solution? Bring tankers. Where from? From wherever in the countryside you can still find some water. <coughs> but then you create conflicts. In Chennai recently, <coughs> where again most of the reservoirs are empty, and where most of the internal, you know, the, the wells in the city give only brackish water. In Chennai recently, the tidal park where most of the IT industry is located was almost on the verge of closing. Why? Because the tankers bringing water to it went on strike and blocked the street. 
Why did they go on strike? Because they were drawing their water from the countryside, from agricultural wells, without asking the farmers. And the farmers started resenting it. They said, you are taking our water. We need it for agriculture. So we'll prevent you. So being prevented, they went on strike. And for five days, after five days, all the big IT industries were on the verge of closing down. You can see how unstable our situations increasingly are. <coughs> uh, this is uh, actually from yesterday, two days article in the Hindustan Times, uh, how a new analysis is showing us that uh, we're going to have very, very hard times in the Indo-Gangetic Plains, that is to say much of North India. So uh, this, and with serious consequences to uh, India's food security, that's what the article says. So in contrast, I don't want to be idealistic, but there was a certain philosophy that this earth, symbolized here as a cow, is something that gives us its milk, but we have to be, you know, we have to take care of this cow, which is a symbol here. And, uh, and this is something which ancient India uh, uh, developed more, uh, in many texts. For example, in the Mahabharata, the, the earth is explicitly compared to a cow. And all the creatures come to it, even the gods, even the demons come to it uh, for milking. So <coughs> there was this practice of tree worshipping, but this is a symbol. The tree actually uh, was again the symbol for nature, for the creation. And the philosophy, the ancient Indian ecological philosophy can be summarized in very few terms. One, the divinity or sacredness of the earth, something that, of course, today we do not consider very important most of the time. Or if we do, our consciousness is completely um, dichotomized. For example, the same Hindu who worships uh, Ganga uh, as a sacred river uh, will not mind discharging effluence or, or waste of all kinds into the very same river. So there is a dichotomy in our consciousness. <coughs> we do know somewhere that nature is sacred, but then uh, in practice it doesn't result in actual uh, uh, you know, uh, respect of nature. Interconnectedness of all creatures is strongly asserted in texts like the Upanishads. For example, there is a saying that consciousness, all creatures, all creatures are impelled by consciousness. All creatures means even the animals and the plants. Compare this to medieval Europe. In medieval Europe, there was a big debate in the Roman Catholic Church. And we have the documents as to, first of all, whether animals had souls. It was not a question of consciousness. The concept of consciousness did not exist. But whether animals had souls, and the answer was no. Animals do not have soul. They were created for the welfare of man. But there was later, in the age of colonialism, a debate as to whether blacks had souls because the slave trade was going on and some people were you know, feeling scruples. So therefore, they said, if blacks have souls, what are we doing? Are we doing you know, something right in, in the, with the slave trade? There was a big debate, and the, the pope of, the, of those days uh, issued a decree that blacks do not have souls. And therefore, it's perfectly all right to, to have the slave trade and whatever else. So you can see the, the contrast here in the value system, and you can yourself conclude which of the two has, you know, offers a brighter future for humanity. Non-hurting, of course, ahimsa. Uh, Non-hurting is not only not killing, it is also non-hurting nature. So this is something that we have to certainly to relearn. And controlling our greed, the, you know, the art of being happy with little is something typically Indian, not asceticism. The ancient Indian values do not ask us to turn into ascetics, but to have moderate needs and just be happy with that. The, again, American consumerist-driven culture asks us exactly the opposite. It asks us to be happy only if we consume more and more and more. If we have not one car but two or three cars, 
not one house, but two or three. So this endless quest for material consumption uh, is something that in the Indian way of thinking cannot result in happiness. Then <coughs> agriculture. In Shivam, it is important to speak of agriculture a little bit because we are now realizing that the benefits of the Green Revolution are kind of uh, now disappearing, fading away. And uh, there is, of course, as you all know, a growing fashion for organic agriculture. But organic agriculture is something that has been pr practiced for millennia in India. But we today have a lot of groups trying to improve upon the traditional techniques, revive some of them, but streamline them, use certain modern techniques like small machines to you know, remove some of the chores involved in the absolutely traditional methods. So uh, the, this can result in the production of biopesticides, biofertilizers. It, of course, creates a healthier soil and ecosystem. And as you can see top right, the virtues of the native species, which have been kind of displaced completely and almost eliminated in the market, in the production system, by some highly high yield hybrids, is, are being rediscovered. For example, when the tsunami in 2004 hit Tamil Nadu coasts, it was found that all the hybrids of rice, the high yielding varieties, were immediately wiped out. However, farmers who were growing some of the traditional varieties found that those varieties were highly tolerant to salinity because you know, the sea invaded for a while over several kilometers and all that salinity destroyed the, the, the new hybrids. But the traditional species could survive because they were hardier. So there are saline resistant species. There are drought resistant species. The yield is less but the sustainability is low. And this is what, again, some very practical lessons we can draw from the Indian knowledge system. Well, these are some articles. I will not spend time on this. You can just read the headline. Rec very recent articles. Uh, this is from February, showing very successful farmers who are equating the modern yields of the so-called Green Revolution, simply doing traditional farming with certain improved techniques. This is another example from Jharkhand. Then economics. And uh, <coughs> I'll take another uh, five or 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Thank you. So do you recognize this gentleman? Everybody should because we're talking about sustainability and he was one exactly. He was one who pioneered this concept of sustainability in his book, Small is Beautiful. What was it that he said? He argued, and he was, after all, a, an advisor to the British government in, in economy. So, and he was a professor of economics, so he knew, uh, you know, his, uh, uh, he knew his trade. And he argued that we are simply following a wrong path, which is not sustainable. And why is it so? Because he said, in Buddhist, he uses the term Buddhist because he worked in Burma for a while. But you can also use the term Indian instead, it will be just the same. <coughs> in Buddhist economics, since consumption is merely a means to human well-being, this is the key, the aim should be to obtain the maximum of well-being with the minimum of consumption. That is more or less what I was telling you, being happy with little. The less toil there is, the more time and strength is left for artistic creativity. Modern economics, on the other hand, considers consumption to be the soul and, and purpose of all economic activity. So elsewhere he says, we have made the mistake of putting consumption at the center. We must remove that and put the human being at the center and then, you know, revisit the whole economy. Of course, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen until some very severe economic crisis forces us to rethink because until then, the, you know, the engines are too powerful. So in India, and I will not introduce all these people, most of you know them, we've had a few very successful industrialists who have followed the old system. I'm coming back to my value of artha. 
That is to say, Atta and the Dharma is making the society around benefit. And all of these, I will not take time, all of these actually practice that and developed a huge number of so-called philanthropic institutions, whether hospitals or schools or colleges, universities, uh, etc. all kinds of what we call today, again, corporate social responsibility. Some of them, like the Tatas, pioneered them even long before the term existed. So this is uh, one thing that, that we need to relearn and make it an implicit form of our economic activities. There are many very important studies which show the presence of the value system in a very discreet way. We don't notice it, but it is there. For example, why did the staff in the Taj Mahal hot Hotel in the 2611 attacks, why did it not run away? It could have. They knew the back exits. And this was troubling for the Harvard Business School. They did a study and they concluded that because about 13 staff members were killed in the process. But by doing so, they saved the lives of many hotel guests whom they were able to hide here and there. So Harvard Business School said that partly this guest is God, you know, Atithi Devo Bhava. Philosophy is responsible for this. I'm not saying it. It is Harvard Business School. Therefore, you've got to accept it. <laughs> <coughs> and they said that the Taj employees felt a sense of, ro of loyalty to the hotel as well as a sense of responsibility to the guests. And these are typically Indian values, which are part of the value system I started with. They also studied, incidentally, the Dhabawalas of Mumbai. We've been talking about them only because the Harvard Business School studied them. <laughs> no Indian Business School or IM studied them before Harvard did. Because we take these things for granted. They are part of our daily, everyday life. We will be studying big American corporates, not the Indian Dhabawalas. So they found that there was something remarkable at work, uh, efficiency, almost zero error, tremendous economy of the system, but they also found that it was a trust-based system. You trust the, the, the man to whom you give not only food in a tiffin carrier, but sometimes a passport, sometimes a little cash, sometimes some documents also. So this is something where we see the Indian values in action. And also when catastrophes strike, like the great flood in, in Mumbai 2005 or recently in Chennai 2015, you see, fi you see suddenly a lot of people helping each other. In Chennai, it was very, I was there caught in the floods and I saw it, how, you know, especially religious organizations, it was not much reported in the, in the press, Jain organizations, Hindu organizations came out and cooked huge quantities of food for the people in the street who were maroon, who could not go anywhere. And a lot of you know, help coming out in many ways. So there you see certain cultural values in actual practice. And that what gives you some confidence that still perhaps you know, Indian society is not quite as bad as we might be tempted to think reading the daily newspapers. And uh, well, I have put a little contrast at the end. I will <laughs> not uh, spend time on it. I think I'm going to skip this because let me c f co f end with the last value, Sundaram, which is the most dispensable value of all, it seems. You know, um, one Swiss lady uh, who is an ecological thinker, I forget her name. I think she's Swiss. And she wrote about uh, 10 years ago. She wrote, the Western civilization is the first civilization in the history of mankind that has made a cult of ugliness. Please think about it. Because it's also, it has come to us also very much. Look at the advertisements. Look at, I don't know, look at our buildings in the street. Look at um, uh, many developments in public life. And you look at a lot of modern art, by the way, please excuse me. <coughs> and you will see ugliness on the march. Now, this is something that ancient India could not have understood. And in fact, it takes me back to my first slide, which is the Rani Kewav in Patan in Gujarat, 
where you have this extraordinary step well. So I have omitted all the steps and gone straight to the well, which the public is normally not allowed to see, but I was luckily allowed one day. I took this photo, and you can see the whole inner side of the well being lined with panel after panel of stone statues, which technologically speaking is an incredibly difficult feat to achieve. I'll not give you the details here, that's not my point, but why should you take so much trouble decorating a well which is a purely utilitarian structure? It's about drawing water, right? Well, no, that's the whole thing. It has to be beautiful. And every aspect of life, whether it is the dress or whether it is these are the, the, the objects of daily use, should have some beauty attached to them. That sense is quite lost today, except perhaps in the saris of our ladies. Apart from this, uh, we, consider, we consider beauty to be highly dispensable. And well, I will not spend more time. At least something of the Indian arts does survive but uh, I, think, uh, I think it is even reviving to some extent. So there is still hope, but I think this value is one that I do want to propose as an important value for the future of humanity because it includes aesthetic refinement and therefore it has uh, consequences on our whole cultural line of development. And um, unless we keep this somewhere at the center that life has to be beautiful, therefore it needs to integrate higher values, uh, we will not flourish. I will end this talk with a statement Sri Aurobindo wrote, my uh, master, if I may say so, in the 1930s, towards the end of a big book called The Life Divine. And you can see how in his language, which people sometimes complain is difficult to follow, but it's not very difficult at all. You will see how he anticipates the kind of crisis that we find ourselves in. And this is about written about 1935. He says, at present mankind is undergoing an evolutionary crisis in which is concealed a choice of its destiny. So there is a choice in front of us. For a stage has been reached in which the human mind has achieved in certain directions an enormous development, while in others it stands arrested and bewildered and can no longer find its way. I believe this is a good description of where we stand today. Man has created a system of civilization which has become too big for his limited mental capacity and understanding and his still more limited spiritual and moral capacity to utilize and manage. So we have this colossal system and we are like dwarfs, you know, overcome by our own creation. Because the burden which is being laid on mankind is too great for the present littleness of the human personality, and that seems to be the crux of the whole issue, because it is using this new apparatus and organization to serve the old infra-spiritual infra and infra-rational cel life self of humanity, that is to say our search for ever-ending consumption and pleasure and enjoyment and so on, the destiny of the race seems to be head heading dangerously. Even if this turns out to be a passing phase of appearance and a tolerable structural accommodation is found, which is what our governments always aim at, a tolerable short-term, short-term structural accommodation is found, which will enable mankind to proceed less catastrophically on in its uncertain journey. This can only be a respite. For the problem is fundamental, and in putting it, evolutionary nature in man is confronting herself with the critical choice which must one day be solved in the true sense if the race is to arrive or even to survive. So I think this is quite a uh, well um, comprehensive picture of what confronts us. And uh, I do rem keep my conviction that we have in the ancient Indian knowledge systems, it's about knowledge essentially, we have a number of keys. Uh, there would be quite a lot more, and in fact it could be a whole program in itself, of searching for keys for the future in India's past and uh, in Indian history also sometimes. 
And uh, I do think India has a lot to offer, not only to itself, but to the world, if we are willing to learn. So the whole question eventually will be, how do we open ourselves to learning? Will it be through catastrophe? Will it be through extreme situations that will compel us to <coughs> rethink? Or can we not anticipate and start uh, preparing the future right now? using this past knowledge as a uh, you know, launching pad and uh, uh, trying to understand that the past is actually never dead. It is still with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Danino, for that brilliantly insightful lecture. And uh, it's open to questions, please. Can you please pass the mics? Somebody is giving you a mic. <coughs> Professor Danino. If I have understood your brilliant lecture correctly, the central theme is that if we want to have a bright, sustainable future, then we must understand the good points of our Indian culture and adopt those good values. Now the problem is how to bring about this huge change in the mindset of our people, especially in India and abroad, who always scoff at our religious practices and our ancient culture. The central point everywhere is restraint. One point, restraint in production, restraint in consumption, restraint in sex, restraint in everything. If we can achieve restraint, I think we can surely achieve a bright future. Now, my simple request to you would be, kindly write a book. <laughs> kindly write a book on these lines so that we can start in the primary schools a, a <coughs> period every day how to save our future. If you just write this book, How to Save Our Future, I think the children will try to understand it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> uh, I wrote a book. <laughs> or rather, I edited a book which is called Knowledge, Traditions, and Practices of India, two volumes that a team of scholars prepared under the direction of Professor Kapil Kapoor, formerly of JNU, a very profound scholar, and myself. And these books were for the CBAC, for an elective course for classes 11 and 12 of the CBAC. And uh, I think it was going well. This was done in 2012 and 13. It was going quite well, and the course was promising, and uh, some schools were beginning to adopt it. And it conveyed in, in two volumes, 24 modules of all of India's knowledge traditions from Ayurveda to martial arts, from philosophy to literature, from mathematics to chemistry, from society to ethics and all of it. And if, as you say rightly, we want to, these Indian values, especially you mentioned the value of restraint, which I, I use in different words in my talk, uh, it has to start at school. It has to be in education, but not as preaching. I'm personally actually against value education as a separate topic. I think that values have to be taught through all the disciplines. Even in mathematics, it is possible to integrate some values. Especially, and of course, in, 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 in literature, uh, in sports, uh, and so on and so forth. So values should come as a matter of course in a natural way. Now this course which we designed 
was because there was a kind of a vacuum and instead of waiting for the system to reform itself, at least we had a separate course that could be adopted. Now, right now, it is in the doldrums. We are trying very hard to convince the CBSC heads that this is a valuable course. They have an absolutely utilitarian notion of what the a course's benefit should be, which is basically to get you a good job. And uh, therefore, uh, we do not know whether we will succeed, but we will keep trying. And uh, well, otherwise, there are many other ways to spread Indian values, and I think all of us can contribute. It's not just a matter of writing a book, but it is also living those values in our personal lives. A word about, uh, yeah. I'm uh, Nirup, an advocate in the Supreme Court here in Delhi. <laughs> Can you, a, a little about what you left out? No, not much, but just two minutes, because it was about governance and statecraft. <laughs> I was hoping I could get away with, with it, but. I think this one. You see, this is something about governance. And there are, again, certain lessons which we can draw from the past. This one. Now, Richard Nixon fam famously said that India is a completely ungovernable country. And well, I don't have a high esteem for Richard Nixon, but, um, but s he did sense something which is right in a way. In fact, nobody can really govern India. Uh, the, it is not possible to govern all of India. You can only govern certain aspects. But most of India governs itself, you know, and also survives by bypassing the government, bypassing the rules. Uh, this is something which is very visible, especially you know, in rural areas, where if the government were to collapse, there would not be such a big difference in the life of the people. <laughs> in a place like Delhi, there, there would be, no doubt. But this is quite, because I've been living in rural India for 40 years, I can say this with, with assurance. And uh, the, we have also another view from the British economist John Robinson a few years ago, she said, whatever you can rightly say about India, the opposite is also true. Now this is something that the Indian logic itself of Nyaya would <laughs> kind of agree with. Eh, right, Akilesh, you, you are the expert here. So, so this is a profound statement that India is full of contradictions, full of paradoxes, and you can't easily define it. If you deal with a country like, I don't know, a small country like Switzerland, though perhaps it is also very complex, but it's a country which you, know, you, you, can, you can circumscribe quite soon. It's impossible to circumscribe India. It's impossible even to comprehend exactly how this country still ticks together because there are so many reasons why it should not. So this is, this is one thing. So therefore, I forget who said, I drew this from somewhere, that India is actually a functioning anarchy. It's not a bad description at all. And uh, somewhere it is a chaos. Look at the traffic in a place like Calcutta, for example, or Mumbai, uh, or Old Delhi, perhaps. It is chaos, but in that chaos, there is some order, which is not visible at first, which is why you know, Westerners can get heart attacks in Indian traffic. But when you understand, you know, when you, when you merge into it, um, uh, there is, there is a, actually there is a hidden order behind it. I pointed out to the fact, which to me is rooted in the old tra democratic traditions of India, that India has only 15 people don't believe this, but these are official statistics from the government of India. In the whole of India, there are 15,000 police stations. So what happens? We read crime in the papers every day. So where, where are those people committing crimes? Well, 
the point is that you have one for, on average, 42 villages. For example, I live close to a village in Tamil Nadu. It doesn't have a police station. None of the neighboring villages have a police station. So if there has to be some need, one police station is there 10 kilometers away. That's the nearest you get. How do, does it manage? Villages manage themselves. We have a lot of very, very bad press on uh, village, what do you call them in Hindi? Cow panchayats. A lot of bad press because yes, there is abuse at times, it's true. But that is the tip of the iceberg. Below that, those panchayats have worked. They have solved their problems, rightly, wrongly, but they're managing their lives. And you find in ancient history, and especially the what we call the early historical era, the Mahajana Palace, for example, you find traditions of assemblies, whether there is a elected king or a hereditary king, because both systems existed, initially, right from the beginning, you have assemblies. So you don't have an absolute power, absolute monarch. There is no such thing as an absolute monarchy in India until the Islamic times. Even the Islamic rulers could never manage to be absolute, though they would have liked to, perhaps. The king is bound by what the assembly tells him. And of course, he can overrule, but that is at great risk. We have democratic institutions like the guild, the shreni, or the nigama. Now, the guild, these were very powerful groups of traders, of craftsmen. They were democratic institutions in themselves because the office bearers were elected from within themselves. And these groups were not aligned with castes. They were not aligned with jatis. They cut across the jatis. They're totally different from the jatis. These groups had their own bylaws, as we would call them today. Okay, we have today also societies with their own bylaws, fine. But today, the government can, can you know, intrude upon the, uh, the society's bylaw. The king of those times had no right to interfere with the internal rules and laws of the Shreni or the Nigam. So these democratic tradition, I could actually, I have a whole lecture on India's democratic tradition, so I'll stop here. They're very strong and are still perceptible in some ways, especially, of course, in traditional or, let us say, more rural India. But even then, the way people organize themselves in sudden situations, you know, catastrophes, uh, you can still feel these uh, notions at the back of people's minds. They don't know history, but it is there somewhere in, in the common life of the Indian people. That was, that was my thought. Thank you. I think that was good that you could also cover this part. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Nomesh Bolia. I'm a faculty member at IIT Delhi. So one of my questions would have been to talk about the slides. That's done. Uh, I talk to a lot of young people, students in IIT beyond, you know, through a variety of activities that we do. And what I'm realizing more and more is as India is getting a little better in terms of its economic status, there is a huge bunch uh, as compared to when I graduated, for example, with my BTEC. Uh, of Indian young people who are willing to look at many of the things that you're talking about. So I think that's a very good positive story that we have Certainly. here, right? Uh, my question though is, you know, so, so Indian young people will probably be interested in a bunch of these things. What does our past have to say about what happens from outside? I'll give you an example. So we have now, you know, gone by the Paris Accord and, you know, we are trying to reach that and all, of, you know, even the, the uh, UN goals. But the U.S. is already talking about going away from the Paris Accord. It's all. It's at least Sorry, from the, uh, the, the, the Paris Climate Accord. Oh yes, yes, yes. Right. So, so India can talk about sustainability, but the rest of the world oftentimes doesn't. Right. And and it does have an impact on us. And we can talk about ahimsa all the time, but through terrorism and a lot of other things, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily believe in that. Right. And so. It makes great sense for one country to follow all this, but when several others do not. No, no, but my point is that. No, no, so India my question does, is. Even India does not follow all this. No, 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 so, <laughs> no, no, so that's why, but that's where I started. I said, I think our young generation, I think in one or two generations, we will probably start following some of these things at least, if not all of it. But what does our, our past teach us in terms of what to do when the rest of the world doesn't? See, I'm glad that you give me a chance to clarify. I'm absolutely not saying that we should go back to the past because there's no way to go back to the past. It doesn't work, it's not possible, and it's not even desirable, because we, we, we are a species in evolution, right? 
So my only point has been that we can draw certain lessons, certain teachings from the past, but the first thing to do is, is to understand it. And therefore to study, call it ancient India, call it classical India, call whatever you like, you know, properly. But this is where our historians have failed so far because they have produced either abstruse theories or controversial, uh, you know, ideologically uh, influenced studies and they have not really generated an interest uh, among the common Indians. So yes, I agree with you. I'm also in an IIT in Gandhinagar, and I deal with a lot of students, and I can also see that interest growing. But many students come to me and they say, for example, they say this summer, I, can I do somewhere a course on, on this, on Indian you know, traditional knowledge systems? And I say, I don't know any place. I don't know any place. Where do you learn that? So, of course, we offer some courses there. There are a few other people here and there scattered. But it's all, you know, on the margins of the system. How do we mainstream that is the critical question. And uh, how do we make this part of, how do we recognize? See, we have been frightened by this slogan of secularism. Many people are still saying, oh, we can't touch all this because we'll be accused of being unsecular. It's, it's absurd. It's a first, of all, so first of all, I'm not convinced it is desirable to be secular. Sri Aurobindo said, and I quote word for word, he said, to me there is nothing secular. What does he mean? He means he is adopting the ancient Indian view that everything is sacred in life. And every, you know, every one of our gestures should be sacred. Every one of our activities should be imbued with something you know, higher. That is the old concept. You try to spiritualize life. So therefore, this having adopted or made, in, made let us say, made a kind of idol of this uh, secularism is, was one of the most grievous errors we could have done. Of course, the whole debate of the intrusion of religion in public spaces, that's, that's different, that has to be addressed. But we've been hypnotized by this, uh, by this uh, slogan, and therefore we, we, you know, there are few people who dare to, because say you are an IT professional, you know, you may be compromising perhaps your career. Some people may criticize you if you want to. I'm happy to notice that there are people, there's one professor in um, IIT Madras who gives courses on the Bhagavad Gita. He's a mechanical, mechanical engineering professor. I just heard about somebody in IIT Delhi. Perhaps that is connected to, to you. That there, there are courses, Center for Human Values in IIT Delhi where you do also create uh, such courses. And these are very hopeful signs. These courses must develop, expand, and remove this sense of guilt, you know, that uh, we have when we touch uh, anything to do with, with ancient India. So this is, this is a kind of, you know, mindset that has to change. Once it changes and we multiply those courses, they will ultimately become mainstream. And I'm not at all for, imp for imposing. I'm not for making anything compulsory. If some students are not interested at all, let them not take these. But those who are, as you said, should have at least opportunity to, uh, to learn. And, and so far, it's very difficult for them to reach. And you have a lot of non-genuine material also. You have a lot of uh, low-quality material singing, you know, glorifying ancient India in wildly exaggerated, non-realistic, and very, very poorly understood manners. So that also doesn't help. It's actually counterproductive. So somewhere we have to find the right balance, the right scholarship, and you know, create the systems that will convey this to our young people. That's the only way. Yeah, professor, in one of your slides you said, Ahidsa, the Krishna you said is taken a position. To, he taken a position in comparison to Ahidsa. In Mahatma Gandhi used to talk of Ahidsa, because it was a strength for him, because he was. So, do you think he was just contrasting this uh, Hindu philosophy, or he was uh, in a position he could not take po strength because he was not having a strength in military power or physical power or mental power? Uh, I'm suggesting now that we take uh, another two, three questions, and then we could sort of try to address because uh, it's time. We only have five to seven minutes more. So you wanted to ask, yeah. And after, I'll, sure. after, after him. Yeah. 
So in pre-industrial times, uh, please be precise with your yeah, question specific. Yeah. Uh, Pre-industrial times, vast majority of India was, uh, let's say, artisans. Uh, a potter could uh, sort of use technology to, for the uh, uh, commerce and arts, all of these three streams to uh, in their sort of uh, life. And art was an integral part of what they did. Now, in post-industrial times, the means of production and the whole thing has changed. So, and we can't sort of impose art on us. I'm, I'm talking about the Sundaram point that you made. So how do we, and now art seems to be related only to the rich. So how do we, what can we do about it, considering where we are now? See, markets, re markets respond to the public taste. You have a supply and demand equation, right? So, so if, if, you, if as a consumer you refuse certain things, and you know you are more conscious and uh, demanding, I mean, once the public taste is, is, is understood, the, the, produ the production will respond to that and adjust itself to that. So I don't think that we should accept a condition where the, the, you know, the, the, the producers, the industry, whatever dictates to us, we have that freedom as a consumer to choose. So therefore, uh, I think this is something which is still in our hands. But then uh, we have to exert that choice very consciously and repeatedly. Uh, yeah, I am Pratap Chinnani from Green Shakti Foundation. Uh, what do you see as the possibility of um, uh, emphasizing or this tutelage to the uh, to the Americans, so that even they can begin to adapt lifestyle changes and cut down emissions. For example, if uh, average per capita emission was to come down to European level, a uh, lot of that two degree can be met. So what is the possibility of this uh, being applied to uh, society on the planet which, uh, or a country on the planet which? Do you mean specifically on the global warming issue? Yes, yes. See, I discussed with friends who are climatologists. We have a good <coughs> climate expert in, <coughs> in uh, uh, our IIT at Gandhinagar. Um, many climatologists are quite pessimistic about these two degrees. It's actually, it has been a kind of artificial barrier used to force politicians to negotiate something. But uh, if you see the rapidity with which the, the, the planet is actually warming up, uh, it does look like the two degree battle is already lost. So the question, and in fact, there is somebody like James Lovelock, you know, the creator of the Gaia theory, who even goes to the extent of saying, let's not even bother about curtailing the, the rise in temperature, the global warming, because it's going to happen anyway. Rather, let us spend our time and energies adapting ourselves to a planet that will be four to six degrees warmer. Uh, that's of course an extreme stand. I, do st I still do think that we should try as hard as possible to reduce the, the global warming. But that two degree battle is, seems to be kind of lost as it is. And the question is what kind of repercussions is this going to have? So I did not quite understand the question about the, the, the US and so on. Yeah, that was the US is, a, is, is primarily responsible Yes. Uh, for creating this phenomena. True, true. So can we not emphasize this, these lifestyle corrections on the U.S., which we can... Should. Uh, <coughs> we should, we should, we should. For and example, I think if that 22 uh, tons per capita can be brought down to eight closer to the European uh, emission. I think that the what, wor what was called the third world nations, you know, the developing nations, should have been far more vocal and uh, vigorous in highlighting the guilt of Western nations in, in the, you know, in, to in altering the global climate in a very short span of time, just 150 or 200 years. Mm -hmm. So I think this was, um, um, I do not know what, what kind of political compulsions were at work. Uh, you know, there are so many things happening behind the scenes that we do not know. but. Certainly, uh, the, there has to be a sense that the kind of American lifestyle is something absolutely unsustainable. The, we have a lot of American 
ecological thinkers who were the first to say that long before we became conscious of these issues in Europe, you know, in the 1970s and 80s especially. So um, I don't know how the, I, mean, I don't know the American mindset very well. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, you know, president after president, even President Obama uh, were unwilling to touch the issue of the American lifestyle. I remember that President Obama spent $350 million on his inauguration ceremony as a president. But this kind of, you know, wasteful practices um, uh, is a kind of a double speak. And uh, I do not know. I do not know how this is going to change. Uh, this, this will have to be addressed by the future. Yeah. There's one question on Ahimsa to be answered. Uh, answered. And we'll take maybe one last question. That's all and close within five minutes. So you can ask and then he can answer both questions together. No, actually, Please be brief, very yeah, brief. Very, very brief. Actually, mine is not a question, just a response to what the earlier gentleman was saying. We see this as a India versus US kind of a debate wherein we are poor and they are rich. But I see the same thing happening within the country where the people who are well off, who are rich, they are also guzzling resources at the same level. Nobody is concerned. So I don't know how we can preach to them when. Just a signal, we should close. So you just want to... Uh, give no, no, that was a very, no very, very pertinent comment. Yeah, we'll Achha, sorry, so we'll take care of the last one, please. No, we, no can, we can see that despite the presence of this value system in India, when the middle class is getting a chance of getting rich, it behaves as badly as you know, any of the Western nations we may criticize. You're absolutely right. So therefore, there is a failure here you know, to understand the, the issues and to behave responsibly as, as Indians. You're right. Madam? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm basically an engineer, but I have adopted uh, social sciences as uh, one of the ways to really uh, bring about what you are uh, uh, wanting to really share today. Uh, as a, a knowledge entrepreneur, I've been really looking at uh, the, the how technology can enable some of these things into actual practice. Uh, for example, if we talk about design improvement and taking the uh, culture, you, you have in the new paradigm design thinking concepts and we can actually bring in a lot of the design concepts of the Indian traditions into practice. And one of the approaches that I've been taking is to really look at tourism. Tourism uh, can promote Indian culture uh, in a very subtle manner, but at the same time bring about a lot of the uh, traditional value system into the actual practice, which touches almost every uh, third person in the, in the society. I mean, uh, a tourist, if he comes to India, he actually brings in employment to 30 people. Uh, at the same time, it actually touches everybody travels today, uh, whether for business or for uh, work or for uh, just pleasure. So there, this is uh, one thing that can really proliferate the, the value system in a, mu a much subtle manner, but at the same time create huge impact. Absolutely. I have no comment to offer except my, my agreement. And I just would like to point out that what we call tourism today was highly practiced in ancient India in the form of pilgrimage. Yes. And pilgrimage was virtually an institution. It was par an integral part of Indian life, and there was a, even a compulsion through various devices, the Puranas in particular are full of them, on you know, practicing Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, whatever, to keep touring and to keep visiting places. And there was a kind of a design to keep people on the move. Uh, so you in, know, the, in this, this is very very clear when you see the ancient literature. Oh. So, so I think oh, you, you can do that later. But so let's close uh, it now after his comments, please, please, <laughs> because it's getting very late <laughs> for everybody. So but you are right. Worked yeah. on it on helping people travel more and more. <coughs> no, no, I'm absolutely in agreement with what you have said. Yes. Krishna is not being promoted. Krishna said, no, go for Hinsa. You can go for war. 
But Mahatma Gandhi was for Ahinsa, it's because of his weakness, or what was the reason? Arjuna, you mean? Ga oh, Mahatma Gandhi. I am no one to judge Mahatma Gandhi, and I will not attempt to. I can only say, looking at it from outside, uh, you see, he was consistent within his belief system. He said to me, Ahimsa is absolute. I will not compromise. For example, during the Second World War, he issued a public appeal to Churchill, saying that uh, this was in 1941, and I have the text of this uh, uh, appeal. And he appealed to Churchill. He said, you must lay down your arms. Britain must lay down their arms because war is evil in all circumstances. That was his belief, that war is always evil. And he said, therefore, you welcome the Germans to take possession of your island. He wrote exactly that. Welcome them to take possession of your island, of your beautiful mansions. And you may lose the war, but you will gain so much more morally. Now, this is, of course, debatable. Uh, I don't think Churchill was very impressed. <laughs> but my question is, how how did the Mahatma reconcile this with his great faith and admiration for the Gita? Because he kept saying that the Gita was the main solace in his life and he was turning to it constantly. How could he reconcile it? Of course, he did. He was asked that question repeatedly. His answer was, for me, the Gita is not about external warfare. It's about internal warfare. We have to fight our own demons and our own failings and whatever it may be. Well, I will leave it to you to decide, sir, whether that interpretation of the Gita is correct. That's all I can say. Thank you so much, Professor Danino. Before we leave, I'll just ask our uh, chairperson, Prof uh, Mr. Katpalia, to please come and hand over this uh, uh, and small token of our appreciation. I think it's been wonderful for you to be able to come and talk to all of us. And thank you so much for this uh, very lively audience. And you have spared your time to come today for this evening. Thank you so much.